monitoring device, which is used. And we'll see some other examples of this a little later in this talk. But once we have uh, created this average field operator, we can ask, what is the, uh, if we made a measurement of E bar, what is, the, what is the probability of finding a given outcome? And of course, it's a Gaussian distribution. This is fairly well known for linear fields. The, it's important to notice the Gaussians arise very, very frequently in probability theory, but for a different reason than here. Uh, uh, in random processes, a Gaussian arises when there is no correlation between successive uh, measurements. Uh, that's not going to be the case in field theory field fluctuations are actually highly correlated. Uh, the Gaussian here comes from a completely different place, namely that the ground state wave function of the quantum, quantum harmonic oscillator is a Gaussian function is where this Gaussian comes from. So in fact, if we use uh, units where H bar and C are set equal to one, which I'll do throughout this talk, then things that have dimensions of energy density are inverse length or, or inverse time to the fourth power. So this is a dimensionless constant. And you could also average in space and get a similar uh, probability distribution. Now I'm going to talk uh, specifically about not just fluctuation of the electric field in the vacuum, but rather the modifications due to the, due to the presence of boundaries as in the Casimir effect. So let, let's consider the situation where you have a boundary such as a conducting plate or more than one conducting plate. And we want to look at the modified fluctuations, meaning the shift between with the plates, without the plates and with the plates. Then we want this uh, shifted correlation function. So this is the change in the electric field correlation function due to the presence of the plates. Suppose we have a charged particle moving, let's say perpendicularly to the plate in the Z direction, starting at a distance Z zero and going to a distance Z zero plus B, then the variance in the particle's energy, uh, which it acquires from these uh, interacting with the fluctuations will be a double integral of the electric field correlation function with the square of the charge in it. And you can show that in the limit that you're close to the plates, that, and these are perfectly, reflect, perfectly reflecting plate, this correlation function, in fact, falls off like the inverse square power of your starting distance. Uh, and one of the physical effects that, that electric field fluctuations, either with or without plates can have, is they can enhance barrier, quantum barrier penetration. That is, if they have a charged particle that is tunneling through a barrier, then the electric, the quantum electric field fluctuations can increase the uh, tunneling probability. That's discussed in this particular paper here. This paper is dealing with just vacuum effects without boundaries, but the presence of boundaries will enhance this effect. And I argued in the paper that is cited here, I make some estimates uh, and think that this may, may uh, in, explain enhanced currents near a boundary through, a, through an interface that was uh, measured by Model et al. in this particular. Uh, the idea being that if you have uh, a junction somewhere at a finite region here and you bring in a plate, there's a Casimir cavity, that increases the electric field fluctuations and, and increases the probability of charges jumping over the barrier. And that may be a large enough effect to explain the uh, increased currents as a, uh, as a result of decreased distance from a plate that's observed in this, in this work. Okay, but I'm going to spend quite a bit of this talk, most of this talk talking about not linear operators like the electric field, but quadratic operators such as the, the energy density. Uh, so of course the energy density is one component of a quantum stress tensor. So this would be you know, asking about the probability distribution for quantum stress tensor fluctuations. 
And again, you have to average the operator, let's say the energy density operator over a finite space-time region. Uh, in fact, here, time averaging is essential. Space averaging is also you know, allowed, but is optional. And one of the first things you can uh, notice about the probability distribution that cannot be a Gaussian, uh, because in general, the odd moments are non-zero. So it has to be, a, in general, will be a skewed non-Gaussian distribution. I'll give an illustration of a simple case uh, in just a, a moment. But typically, uh, the probability distribution will have a lower cutoff at some negative value. Uh, but it will not, uh, but uh, uh, there's no cutoff in the, in the, on the high, on the positive end. There was energy density fluctuations in the vacuum are unbounded above. Uh, and as we'll discuss in four dimensions can possibly be rather large, but there's a lower limit on how negative they can be. And this is essentially the, the quantum inequality bound on expectation values in arbitrary state. Mathematically, it's the lowest eigenvalue of the average operator. Because there we're dealing with something like energy density, which in classical physics is non-negative. But in quantum physics can become negative, slightly negative. Uh, but there still are lower bounds on the eigenvalues that it can have. And that's essentially what a quantum inequality bound is, that the, the lowest eigenvalue of an operator is both the lowest value you can find in a measurement in any quantum state, but it's also the smallest expectation value that you can find in any state. Okay, let me give a, kind of a, an illustration of both the positive tail and the cutoff. Uh, in, in general, of course, in four spacetime dimensions, it's very hard to compute the probability distribution explicitly, although I'll talk about some, some results for it. But in two spacetime dimensions, it's possible to give a closed form expression for the probability distribution. So this is a massless scalar field in two spacetime dimensions, uh, which in this case has been averaged with a Gaussian function. That just happened to be a convenient choice for the, for the paper with this work I did with Chris Fuster and Tom Roman. So we imagine the energy density is averaged in time. And then uh, the, of course in two dimensions, energy density, if H bar and C are equal to one has dimensions of inverse length or inverse time squared. So X here is a, uh, a dimensionless variable and the probability distribution is given as a function of that variable. So on the positive side, it falls off as an exponential. Uh, so the probability of finding a very large energy density decreases exponentially. But in fact, it go, uh, it, you can also find uh, negative values between zero and minus one over 24 pi. That's the, that's the lowest eigenvalue of this, uh, of the averaged operator in this case. And it's, the probability distribution is actually plotted here. Uh, it has, uh, because of this strange exponent here, which is slightly less than minus, uh, uh, it's slightly larger than minus one, the probability distribution is singular in this case as you approach the lower bound, but it's integrally singular. So the integral of, uh, of this function from minus one over 24 pi to infinity is, is in fact one. And in this particular case, if you made measurements, 84% of the time you'll find a negative value because of the large, uh, the rise in the probability distribution negative, but the, the mean value is, is zero in the vacuum. So the, the large positive values, the less frequent uh, results of measurements exactly outweigh the negative, more frequent, the negative, but uh, smaller in magnitude values that one finds. Okay, but of course we're, 
physically we're more interested in four space-time dimensions where the situation is more complicated and is in general in, in quantum field theory there are a lot of nice things you can do in two dimensions but uh, either fortunately or unfortunately we don't live in two space-time dimensions we live in four space-time dimensions where quantum field theory is more complicated so we're interested in some uh, local operator which is quadratic of the fields. And this could be, for example, the, uh, the normal ordered energy density uh, as, an, as an illustration, whose, whose vacuum expectation value is zero. So the average of all outcomes would be zero. Uh, but this, the averaged quantity can be formed now by averaging potentially both in time and in space with different functions. These are sampling functions that basically, again, describe the, the measurement, how the, uh, how the operator is measured. And for quantities such as energy density in four dimensions has dimensions of inverse length or inverse time to the fourth, our dimensionless variable has to be tau to the fourth times the average operator. So I want to say a little bit about what we can say about the probability distribution in this case. And there are essentially two approaches that my collaborators and I have used. One is computing moments of the uh, moments of the average operator. And the other is a numerical diagonalization method, which I'll give a few more details about in, in a moment. No, no pun intended. Okay, so as I, I said, these, these functions uh, f uh, of t and g of t should describe the measurement process. Uh, that is that the measurement is made in a finite interval of time and a finite uh, interval, uh, interval of space. And their effect is suppress the high frequency modes. The averaging, the high frequency modes have uh, basically average out and you get contribution from modes, primarily modes of the order of the averaging scales. The other very important point uh, is that measurement should really be done in a finite space-time region, uh, namely that say in time, they need to start at a particular time and end uh, uh, and ideally should end at a finite time in the future. Uh, they have to start at a finite time in the past because we, uh, if we were to use a function with a tail like a Lorentzian or a Gaussian, that, that would basically describe a measurement that had to, had to begin in the infinite past, which is not really physical. Uh, so you would need a function that is strict, what mathematicians call a function with compact support, meaning that is, it is strictly uh, zero outside of a finite interval. Uh, and then of course, those, these are necessarily non-analytic functions uh, that do that. And we're going to see some important consequences of this uh, uh, restriction in a moment. So in, in particular, one of the consequences is that the, uh, if we take the Fourier transform, so f hat of omega is a temporal Fourier transform of f of t, g hat of, of wave vector k is the spatial Fourier transform of g of x. These Fourier transforms for a, for a smooth, that is an infinitely differentiable but compactly supported function uh, need to decay faster than any power but they actually will also, in order to be compactly supported, need to decay more slowly than exponential. And the characteristic rate of decay is as an exponential of a fractional power. Now, in fact, we can, in some of our papers, we constructed a class of these functions that are described by a parameter alpha, where alpha is some real number between zero and one. Uh, and the case alpha equals one is of special, in, uh, sorry, alpha equals one half is of special interest. Because in fact, in one of our papers, we show there's a simple electrical circuit, an RC circuit, which when you close the switch, the current 
rises in accordance with a function like this. So this is clearly a non-analytic function. As t approaches zero from above, it goes to zero faster than any power. Uh, and then as, as t goes to plus infinity, it approaches one. So this describes a switch on. Uh, and in fact, because you can create electrical circuits that, uh, which switch on is this, they're, 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 you can imagine realistic measurements be, being made with, uh, with such functions. But because the functions are falling off more slowly than exponential, in this case, they're falling off in Fourier space as the exponential of a square root. This leads to enhanced contributions from high frequency modes. And that's going to have a important consequence for the probability distribution. So in particular, the, uh, uh, the, the rate of, uh, if you use the moments approach where you look at the rate of growth of the moments with time averaging, you find that the moments grow as a factorial but it's uh, three n over alpha factorial. So for example, if alpha is a half, then this is the six n factorial, which is much faster than the moments of a, say the Gaussian grow. And this leads to a probability distribution that falls off like, a, like an exponential of a fractional power, where the fractional here is alpha over three. So if alpha is a half, this is a one sixth power here. So, so there are two important lessons here. Namely the, uh, the probability distribution is very sensitive to the form of the switching. Uh, uh, and also switching in the finite time interval can lead to very large stress fluctuations. The probability of a very large value is much higher than you might've expected because of if we're just averaging in time with Africa's half, it's decaying only as the exponential of a one sixth power of the energy density. You know, the, the dependence on the switching function you can think of as being a result in quantum measurement theory. They believe that, so we, we understand that in quantum mechanics, often what you find depends a lot on how you look for it. And that's especially true here your measurement device uh, in some sense of the switching function you use uh, plays a very important role in determining the outcome of the measurement. Now, if we average on a length scale uh, L as well as the time scale, then the asymptotic form of the probability of the moments grows a little more slowly n over alpha factorial for a very large n. That leads to a probability distribution that falls off like essentially x to the alpha as opposed to alpha over three. So this is still uh, more slowly than an exponential. Uh, so as you might expect, spatial averaging decreases the probability of large fluctuations, but it's still very large compared to what you've gotten from a Gaussian fluctuation. And in general, if the spatial scale is small compared to the temporal scale, then as X increases, initially you get uh, a behavior that just uh, that is the, that would be what you would expect if L were zero, world line behavior. But then there's a smooth there's a smooth transition in the probability distribution to the space time average behavior. Namely, your probability distribution goes from falling like an exponential of alpha over three to a somewhat small, faster fall off of, alpha, of x to the alpha, exponential of x to the alpha. But that's still, if alpha is a half, is still exponential of a square root, which is relatively slow, slow fall off. Okay, so the alternative approach, uh, which I want to say a few words about, is numerical diagonalization. David, you can think of the, in, if you do a mode expansion 
of a quadratic operator, such as the energy, average energy density operator in terms of creation and annihilation operators. It's a quadratic form like this. Uh, you just plug in the fields expanded in terms of mode functions. You get, and because this is normal ordered, uh, it has a dagger A in it. No, uh, and then a, a maybe a constant here as well. But a Bogumov transformation is a transformation between a one set of creation and annihilation operators to a second set, a linear transformation like this. And it, we seek one which diagonalizes it, maybe which casts the operator in this form, which means that the eigenstates are now number eigenstates of the B basis. So the eigenstates, for example, of average energy density will be formally these number eigenstates. The, the, the B operators don't have an obvious physical interpretation. It's the A operators that create and annihilate physical photons. But these are more of a, a mathematical convenience. But this, this uh, Bogleyboff transformation and diagonalization be done in a system with a finite number of degrees of freedom and be done numerically. In fact, we've developed a program that allows us to do this with up to a few hundred. We've been, been able to do this with up to about 600 modes. So you're diagonalizing a 600 by 600 quadratic form. And when you do that, then you get basically expressions for the eigenstates. You can calculate the probability of finding any given eigenstate in the vacuum state and construct a probability distribution. And it basically gives results that are consistent with the moments approach. So here's a, well, the next graph comes from this 2021 paper with uh, Peter Wu and Rico Shippakasi. So basically this is the, the averaged, average of a quadratic operator. Strictly speaking, we use uh, uh, the square of the time derivative of a scalar field, but that essentially is, has the same properties as the energy density of a massless scalar field with alpha equals a half. Lambda is the corresponding parameter for the spatial averaging function. How fast its probability distribution falls off. As I already told you that in the space-time average region, we expect of the fall off to be an exponential of x to the one sixth. In the time average region, an exponential of x to the one half. Now that, uh, that shows up pretty clearly in these numerical results. This, uh, this solid curve are the plots of all of our, of our eigenvalues plotted as a function of the essentially x uh, log x. And this is the log of minus the log of the probability distribution. So if, if this is an exponential of a, of a power, those would be straight lines. As you can see at the small end where time averaging is dominant, we have a slope of about, of about one sixth. And then there's a smooth transition region. And at the upper end, we get a slope of one half, of course, by an exponential of the square root. So this gives very good confirmation of the results that were derived analytically using the, uh, the moments approach. Okay, so let me say a few words about what are, what are some of the possible physical effects of large stress fluctuations? Well, I'll just, I won't have time to go into uh, too much detail about these, but of course, a, a large stress sensor or energy density fluctuation has, has the possibility of causing fluctuations of the gravitational field because the stress sensor is the source of gravity. And it could, could give a contribution to the primordial spectrum of, of cosmological perturbations, which would necessarily be non-Gaussian. I mean, so far, the, no significant amount of non-Gaussianity has been detected in, for example, the cosmic microwave background radiation. But if it were, the, uh, the stress of the large stressors fluctuations could be a possible source. And it has particular sig signature that might allow you to distinguish it from other sources of non-Gaussianity. 
Another possibility that my collaborators and I are, are working on is creation of primordial black holes in the early universe. A large energy density fluctuation could, could create a small, cause a small black hole to form, which might leave some, have some physical effects. Uh, then other effects are the, in addition to electric field fluctuations, enhancing barrier penetration, the uh, stress interfluctuations, radiation pressure fluctuations can also do that. It was discussed by my former student, Haiyun Huang and I in a paper some years ago. And it can also lead to increased rates of vacuum decay in quantum field theory, what are called false vacuum decay. And then there are analog models. There are fluid models, for example, where the density of the fluid behaves in, uh, when the phonons are quantized, behaves uh, almost exactly the same way as the energy density in quantum field theory. And there are possible eff observable effects in the laboratory of, of these density fluctuations that might be observed. However, in the I want now to go on and talk a little bit about large radiation pressure fluctuations on atoms uh, because they, uh, they have a, uh, they respond to something a little bit different uh, than a stress tensor. That is the, I should go back here and maybe say a few words about this barrier penetration by charged partic quantum particles. In this paper, we considered charged particles uh, and radiation pressure, uh, that is the, uh, which of course is a component of the, uh, the energy flux of the momentum flux is a component of the stress tensor. And the large uh, uh, radiation pressure fluctuations on a charged particle can also put it, push it over a potential barrier uh, in the same way that uh, an electric field fluctuation can. And we, in this paper, we talked about the effects uh, show that there are, uh, that it could explain some mysterious results in nuclear physics. When, when nuclear physicists uh, first started uh, accelerating heavy ions and slamming uh, medium-sized nuclei into very heavy nuclei, they were surprised to find that the fusion cross-sections were much larger than, than predicted by the previous uh, uh, models that could be usually understood from simple barrier penetration. And there are nuclear physics explanations for this. That is, it could be that the, uh, that the, the very heavy ion is exciting uh, collective modes inside the heavy nucleus. But in the, uh, uh, we also pointed out that the radiation pressure fluctuations uh, due to, could also possibly explain this, this possibility. So they, they could have been observed, although that's still a little controversial. Okay, so, but let's now uh, spend the rest of the time talking about atoms. So as you uh, all know, when light scatters off of an atom, at least light with sufficiently low frequency, it scatters by Rayleigh scattering. Uh, which has a characteristic omega to the fourth power of the cross section. And it's the coefficient depends on the static polarizability of the atom. So this is the limit where the frequency of the light is low, is small compared to the, say, the, the atomic energy separation between, let's say, if the atom is in its ground state, the, uh, the transition frequency, the first excited state. Uh, uh, and if we wanted to uh, consider a radiation pressure force, of course, if this, constant, if this were just a constant, the radiation pressure force on a, on a material object would be proportional to the linear momentum flux in ENM, ENM which is basically E cross B in the, in the Z direction. However, here, the cross section has a strong frequency dependence which basically translates into extra time derivatives on the electric and the magnetic field operators. So if you write this out in, uh, 
write these out as sinusoidal fields, each time derivative brings out a power of omega. So you can think of this omega to the fourth as coming from uh, the essentially this operator, fluctuation of this operator, which is E double dot cross B double dot within a, a truly constant uh, out in front, as long as we're in the regime where uh, static polarizability is appropriate. So if we want to look at the fluctuations of this force, we need to average this operator RZ at least in time, that's what we'll, we'll assume here, a time average along the world line with some sampling function who, which will be determined by the nature of the measurement we're going to make. And then the probability of a large radiation pressure fluctuation on an atom is determined by the corresponding probability distribution. But now this is a little different than the probability distribution for operators like energy density because of these derivatives in here. This operator has basically, in order to be dimensionless, you need a tau to the eight out in front rather than a tau to the fourth. Uh, and that changes the nature of the probability distribution as well. As in particular, the asymptotic form of the probability distribution for large x, uh, in the, this is still the world line limit, is going to fall off at, as an exponential of a 1 14th power here. Uh, uh, this is a very slow decrease. This 1 14th comes uh, because we assume that the sampling function is still described by an alpha of over half. So remember in, in the case of the energy density, we would have had a, uh, a, a one sixth here, which is basically you can think of it as one, th one third divided by half. One third essentially is the effective number of space dimensions. But by adding those two extra time derivatives, you go from a one third to a one seventh. Then you divide one seventh by half, you get one fourth, one fourteenth. That's where this uh, strange fraction comes from. Uh, so, of course, large fluctuations are going to be much more probable than uh, you might have guessed. And we can understand physically where this slow de decrease comes. It comes from the extra time derivatives, which gives a much greater weight to high frequency modes. That is, when you look at, uh, because of these extra time derivatives uh, in here, high frequency modes will contribute much more to the fluctuations of this operator than it would to the momentum fluctuation of the momentum flux itself. And so that, that's essentially the physics behind this relatively slow decrease. Okay, so I'm going to uh, mention a, a model uh, using Rydberg atoms, which is in a recent paper of mine in FizRev A. So the basic idea is you use a short pulse to excite, because as you, uh, as most of I think know, a Rydberg atom is, is an atom in which an electron has been excited uh, from a state to a, to a really high excited state. So if you consider the idealized case of a one electron atom like a hydrogen or an alkali metal atom, and you take the one valence electron and put it up into a, uh, into a very high principal quantum number, that that's, that's, what's, that's a Rydberg atom. And when you do that, the, uh, both the polarizability uh, increases as the seventh power of, the, of n, where a, a0 is the Bohr radius. So this is the A0 cubed is approximately the polarizability of the, the atom in its ground state. And the radius also increases as n squared. So both the size and especially the polarizability increase dramatically. But what's especially important is the increase of the polarizability. This rapid change basically averages the radiation pressure in time. Uh, from something, uh, so if, uh, if n is the order of 10, then 
uh, the polarizability is going to increase by seven orders of magnitude in a relatively short time, which you can think of as effectively switching on the, uh, the polarizability from a very small value to a much larger value in a time scale tau, which is the switch on time of a laser pulse. And here that's the, essentially the pulse profile the, uh, is going to be the sampling function here. The f of t will be the envelope function of this uh, laser pulse. Now this is going to result in a large radiation pressure fluctuation, which would give the atom a transient kick, which we can think of as a loan of linear momentum from the vacuum. So just as in the case of energy density fluctuations, where I said that there was a, a relatively high probability of a large energy density fluctuation, if you see a large energy density fluctuation, you ask, where, where is that energy coming from? Well, it's coming from the vacuum, but this doesn't really violate conservation of energy because conservation of energy is, is strictly speaking only enforced on very long time scales. Energy can fluctuate on finite time scales. Uh, in fact, it's the the fact that the, uh, the dimensionless variable scales with tau is what enforces that. That is for a fixed value, let's say the energy density, as tau increases, this dimensionless variable increases and as the probability of fluctuation goes down. So you can, you can get a very large energy, but the time that you can keep it uh, is, effectively limited by the energy time uncertainty principle. But you can still have a finite loan of energy or equivalently momentum from the vacuum for a finite time. Okay, so let me uh, just quote a few estimates that are given in that FISREV A paper that I mentioned. So I, I give a, a kind of a model scenario with a laser pulse that switches on with, according to alpha of a half, which is then that function that's uh, exponential of minus one over T in time. And show that, uh, that you can estimate the recoil speed under some, with some assumptions about the profile of the laser pulse as basically being this, of course, this is units where C is one. So strictly, this is the, this is a fraction of the speed of light, which turns out to be about 800 meters per second. And it also varies inversely as the atomic mass. So of course, hydrogen would be the best, would be the most favorable uh, atom. The, the, it would get, a, it might get a recoil of about 800 meters per second, which might be large enough to measure. Larger atoms, of course, will recoil at a correspondingly smaller rate. And of course, also you want to know what is the probability of such a fluctuation occurring? Well, it depends both on N and on the pulse profile, but the most favorable case, it could be as large as about 1%. That means that you'd have to do this experiment uh, a hundred times before you have a, a chance of seeing the Rydberg atom recoil at this speed. Uh, but as long as you're prepared to be patient, and re repeat the, uh, the experiment many times, and if the uh, size of recoil velocity, which would show up uh, presumably in Doppler shifts, of, uh, for example, emitted photons, yeah, if that's measurable, then this might be observable. Of course, the other thing we have to compare this to are competing effects. There's also thermal motion, which could hide the recoil speed. Of course, the way you suppress thermal motion is to go to low temperatures. So you can see if you cool down uh, to sufficiently low temperatures, then the thermal motion can be very small compared to the expected recoil velocity. The other effect that when you're hitting uh, atoms with laser pulses is the recoil due to photon emission or absorption. If an atom, for example, emits or absorbs a photon with an energy of an electron volt, then typically its recoil speed will be about 10 to the minus nine of the speed of light. 
or or so if it has a mass of oh mass of hydrogen atom and less of course for more massive atoms but you can see it's it's conceivable to have both the thermal motion and the photon recoil photon emission absorption recoil smaller than the uh, effect of the radiation pressure recoil. So it may be uh, that this effect could be large enough to, to measure. Okay, I'm going to summarize what I've told you about and then we can stop for a discussion. So some of the key ideas of this talk are that that, uh, the, that the, uh, first of all, uh, quantum electric field fluctuations can enhance quantum tunneling even in the vacuum state by basically giving electrons a kick over a barrier. And they are themselves enhanced by the Casimir effect. If you bring a plate in, that enhances the quantum electric field of fluctuations. Uh, as I uh, suggest uh, in the preprint that I uh, quoted, I think that may, may be the explanation for some of the results that uh, Garrett Modell and his collaborators have seen. Second point is the fluctuations of quadratic operators, such as energy density, uh, are a little bit more complicated, but they're also described by a, uh, a probability di distribution that uh, de decays relatively slowly. So the probability of large fluctuations is considerably greater. But these probabilities are also very sensitive to how the operator is measured the uh, details of the sampling function, which again is tied up to the details of the shapes of laser pulses that might be used in the experiment or similar, similar issues. And on the theoretical side, the, uh, the, the information about the probability distribution we have in four dimensions can be found either from some analytic estimates from the rate of growth of moments or by numerical diagonalization calculations of finite number of degrees of freedom. And these two result, approaches seem to agree. And the large stress fluctuations could have observable effects, possibly in cosmology or in laboratory ex experiments, such as density fluctuations of fluids. And finally, I've just told you about the uh, large radiation pressure fluctuations on atoms. Uh, which may also give observable effects in terms of observable uh, kicks due to momentum fluctuations on the atom. So I think at that point I will uh, uh, stop. And uh, as I, uh, unfortunately, I have to leave at three o'clock to, uh, to join another meeting, but I think this still allows uh, uh, hopefully an adequate amount of time for discussion in the next 16 minutes or so. Yeah, th thank you so much, uh, Larry. That's a great summary of your work. Um, I know I have a few questions. I don't know if uh, anyone uh, listening in has any questions. Yeah, Charles, uh, I had a, a, a quick one. Okay. Uh, I, I found, I really found your talk really wonderful and concise, um, packed with info. The question is, where at an astronomical level, uh, stars, neutron stars, magna stars, or other phenomena, let's get away from black holes, which are not the easiest to observe, would might one see some of these effects occurring naturally, uh, you know, very high uh, radiation, et cetera. And does the, the theory and stuff that you've laid out in any way explain it uh, in more detail? Okay, I, I think the best case, uh, uh, if you're dealing with a lot, very large scale effects would be in cosmology. Uh, the, the reason is, of course, in cosmology, you have relatively high energy scales. Uh, and as a result, potentially short time scales. So for example, I, I mentioned the idea of primordial black hole nucleation. Uh, the question is, there, there needs to be some kind of a switching on a short time scale uh, to have a, and the, these of course would not be stellar mass sized black holes. These would be uh, much, uh, much smaller black holes that might Hawking evaporate in a relatively short time, but they still would leave physical effects. 
I mean, there are, there are bounds on even, uh, even on macro, macroscopic black holes created at different times because of the effects of the, of the thing might uh, create. But to create a small black hole from an energy density fluctuation, you need something occurring on a short time scale. So the possibility, the best possibility is the early universe, such as either a phase transition, a thermodynamic phase transition that occurs on a fairly short time scale, or maybe the end of inflation itself. Most inflationary models predict that inflation ended and they made a transition to a radiation dominated universe on what would really be a very small, more like a particle physics time scale rather than a present day astronomical time scale. So that I think would be your, your best bet if you want to look in uh, at a macroscopic level to look to cosmology. Yeah. Do you have any planned experiments for the atom uh, recoil effect? Uh, have you been looking into how you might measure that or who, who you might work with on that? Well, yeah, I'm hoping to interest some people in that, but I, uh, but I haven't, uh, I haven't been in any discussion yet with, uh, with experiment. So if there are any experimenters who might be able to, to look at, uh, look for anomalous recoil of, of Rydberg atoms, uh, that uh, that would be, I think that would be what one would want to try to do. Right. Yes, that'd be very exciting. Um, uh, Garrett, did you have a question? Sure. Um, this is something that you just mentioned peripherally in your talk. Uh, you had talked about how the vacuum can loan momentum or energy. Right. And we can only keep it for a limited time. Mm -hmm. As you know, and as I'll be talking about on Saturday, uh, my thought about how our asymmetric results uh, can be modeled. Uh, you, you've modeled our symmetric results, but our asymmetric results yeah. um, could be that uh, we're, we're capturing this loan and not giving it back using a, a, a nonlinear process. Does that make any sense from your perspective? Well, I think there would have to be some hidden, if we're talking about, say, an energy loan, that I think there would have to be some hidden energy source someplace. The, the, so, some, uh, some benefactor who pays off your loan for you, maybe without even telling you. Um, <clears throat> what about the vacuum itself? Well, at least, uh, at least in the simple version of the uh, uh, of vacuum as we understand it in quantum field theory, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty relentless banker. It insists on all of its loans being repaid. Now, it's true that, of course, uh, once you go from flat space time to curved space time, and where, where things are time dependent, the situation is more complicated uh, because there, are, there is a well-known effect of cosmological particle creation where the, the time dependent gravitational field in the early universe could create particles. In some sense there, there's, there's energy, and th those are real particles that stay around. So in some sense, there's energy that came out of the vacuum. But that, that's, that's allowed because on a time dependent background, energy conservation is not really enforced. The background itself, you could think of as being an energy source. So, cool. um, please go ahead. Well, I was just wondering if the loan could be directional. In other words, you loan from one direction and then you pay it back in a different direction. <laughs> Are you talking about directions in space or directions yeah. in time? Yeah, directions in space, not directions in time, okay. right? Yes, yeah, spatial directions, yeah. Well, it certainly would involve some new physics, let me put it that way. If the vacuum were, were allowed you to, to do that. So I don't, mm -hmm. I, I don't see an obvious explanation in terms of quantum field theory as we currently understand it. Um, if I uh, can continue, if, if we take a, so putting aside the energy issue, mm -hmm. um, we know that the dynamical Casimir effect changes 
uh, these uh, virtual exchange particles into real particles. That's right. And so we can actually get something real out of the vacuum, right? Right, but of course that that's a, the dynamical Casimir effect is in fact the, a, a very close analogy to cosmological particle creation, mm -hmm. because of course to, to have a dynamical Casimir effect you need a time dependent background field, and ultimately it's the source of the energy of the created photons. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions out there? Uh, Robert, your hand's still up. Does that mean you have a question or you just didn't put your hand down? I was wondering why the blood was coming down. I'll put my hand down. <laughs> ah. You know, so I had a question about, you know, you discussed the impact on fusion cross sections of the enhanced barrier penetration. Have you considered that might be a factor in what people are calling low energy nuclear reactions, which I know are controversial. And although there are a lot of people that have still measured some effects that are not explained, have, have you thought about that? Well, the, the sort of effects that uh, in the paper that we, we discussed, we looked at some papers. So these, uh, the specific kinds of reactions that, uh, that we looked at were, I think experiments where you're you're fusing uh, a medium sized atom like argon with a very heavy atom, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, and there the the observed cross sections are, are much larger than had been expected. Now, right. uh, and we do argue that the that the vacuum radiation pressure fluctuations could be large enough to explain that. But there, there certainly are other more conventional nuclear physics explanation, such as excitation of, of vibrational modes of the, of the target nucleus, et cetera. So I think, I think although that's not understood, it's certainly not guaranteed that it's a, a vacuum fluctuation effect. Okay, thank you. Um, Ed, I think has a question. Sure. Um, very interesting work, and and I'm still trying to get my head around it. Um, uh, but um, I, I'm just curious. I mean, I've I've heard that the entire universe could have emerged from a slight inhomogeneity in the <laughs> in the vacuum. Um, uh, but I'm wondering uh, what sort of possibilities uh, you see for your work, and um, are there any insights in how to uh, maybe induce. Um, uh, these fluctuations, you know, like a vacuum engineering, um, uh, you know, there's been talk of that, but I, I don't know if there's really been any real work in that space other than, um, you know, some of these effects we're talking about. Well, I think some kind of time dependence is probably the, uh, the best bet for inducing these. So just like cosmological particle creation or the dynamic or Casimir effect arise when, when you have a time dependent background field. Uh, uh, similarly, these large vacuum fluctuations that uh, uh, I've been discussing arise when you, when you make a, a, a short time scale measurement. Uh, switching on a very short time scale with a function that rises very rapidly. Uh, so I, mean, I gave an illustration of that with the, the Rydberg atom model, where the, the shape of the laser pulse that you use to, to excite the Rydberg atom will play a crucial role in the probability of it getting a large uh, kick from the vacuum. Fascinating, thank you. Yeah, Pablo has a question. Hi, Pablo. Thank you. Um, so too many of these things are, are beyond my ability to comprehend, but I, I was fascinated by the valuable use of metaphorical language involving loans and, and uh, things that I am working with the World Bank on financial instruments to deal with shocks. Yeah. And uh, in my experience, when a metaphor works, if you leave the space, in this case physics, and go to the space of the metaphor and talk with people who are very familiar with it, they may illuminate something that you haven't noticed about what is going on or what you could do to try to experiment, to test hypotheses and so on. So a question for you is, would there be value 
in bringing into this physics conversation sophisticated thinkers from the risk financing universe who can talk about how loans happen in terms of shocks and what instruments are could that be of use to uh, physicist thinking of this to bring people who are experts in loans to think quantum physics or is that too too absurd a level of curiosity well, possibly well, i think the the analogies are probably not shouldn't be pushed too far uh, but a real loan in a bank of course is quite different than uh, uh, than anything that happens in quantum field theory so uh, i'm not sure about that that part yeah thank you pablo thank you. Um, so Gene in the, in the chat has a comment that, well, maybe this loan of energy can come in decreasing dark energy. So in other words, <laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but, um, in other words, yeah, we, you know, it has to come from somewhere if you're going to keep it. <laughs> Possibly, but I don't, uh, of course, dark energy, strictly speaking, is negative pressure. Right. So, constant. So, of course, in addition to large energy density fluctuations, you could have large pressure fluctuations, which would momentarily decrease the dark energy. But I don't, I don't immediately see any obvious way to harness uh, the dark energy that seems to be driving the ex the accelerated expansion of our universe. Right. To, for this purpose. So, but maybe the dark energy comes from other people harvesting it, and we are just seeing the effect of that. That's uh, <laughs> I don't, I can't, I can't <laughs> no, no one guys. Just a thought. Um, if you have time for one more question, I think Azuni uh, has a question for you. Uh, yes, hello. Um, I have a question that's kind of uh, coming off uh, the answer to Ed Lance question. Uh, you said that to induce these vacuum fluctuations, most probably a uh, time varying field would work. But, uh, would that also work with uh, spatially varied field, uh, say by a clever construction of boundary conditions? Well, spatial, that might help. Uh, at least for uh, for momentum loans, because just as energy conservation is linked to time translation symmetry, um, linear momentum conservation to space translation symmetry. So and when you have a situation that is not spatially translation invariant, then in fact, linear momentum need not be conserved. So I think spatial variation would be most likely tied to linear momentum than more than energy specifically. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, well, um, I guess we're pretty much at the top of the hour. So uh, I want to th thank you again. Okay. Well, thank uh, you for sharing your work with us. Uh, very, very much appreciated. It's, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. And I hope you can join some of the uh, discussions on Saturday. And you might find some of the uh, like Raymond Chow's discussions of transduction of EM and gravitational waves tomorrow of interest too, if you have time. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll see what I can do. But I'll okay. see on Saturday, late Saturday afternoon. Okay. okay so I'll say goodbye for now. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Um, okay, so our next talk is, uh, uh, Larry had to leave earlier. Our next talk is going to be John Bush at uh, 3.15. Um, so uh, we should wait for that. But if we want to continue the discussion, if anyone has any more thoughts they would like to share about this loaning of momentum from the vacuum, um, that you have to repay exactly as you borrowed it is what I think uh, I heard Larry say. Um, is that your interpretation, Garrett? Well, he says you have to repay it with interest. He has a whole paper on that. Right, right, with interest, yes. You have to pay a little bit more. Um, I really liked um, Pablo Suarez's comment about uh, following an analogy. Uh, because if, if you think about it, 
that's what our physical models are. They are analogies for reality. It's not reality itself. It's just they're really tight models. And if they're tight enough, then you can predict what physical reality will do because uh, the, the model does that. But, the, you know, with the, our observations are baked in to the models. So we ensure that our models give the observations we've observed and they do a great job of that, but they won't give us things outside of what we've observed. And so, in other words, if we, you know, Larry's model will not predict generation of energy from the vacuum because of the way we assume the va vacuum behaves, right? I mean, that's, it's baked in. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I think that the model sometimes predicts something that wasn't in it in the first place. I, I guess that's true, yeah. Um, and that's what happens with, I mean, think of, of the advent of quantum mechanics and all sorts of things. Uh, it was built up piece by piece uh, with ingredients that made predictions that weren't part of the ingredients. The uh, metaphorical structure is very much a part of the neural structure of our brains when you get into cognitive science. I mean, that's how we understand things in terms of other things. So a number of years ago, we developed something called metaphoric thinking. And I'll give you one simple example, and you'll see the power, and I think you're 100% right, Garrett, on this one. So let's say I had a concept of easy in, hard out easy in, hard out. Well, that's a diode, right? Easy in, flow in. It's a asymmetrical flow. Uh, you'd have it with a ratchet. Uh, you know, you'd have it with a, with a flapper, like a one-way valve. But then you would also have it uh, in a membrane and biological systems that permit flow more in one direction or another. You'd have it in economics. You'd have it in tariff and trade theory. You'd have it in marriage, easier to get married and harder to get divorced, easier to hire harder to fire, on and on and on. But each one of these other domains have concepts that are translatable, not all of them, but many of them into another domain. So I agree with you completely, Gar uh, not the, the, the gentleman who originally proposed it, Pablo, is that there are things and subtleties and there are object relationships between the objects that constitute this domain that, that then can be translated back and get you to think of things you'd never would have thought of before that actually are a part of the reality that you just don't see. So I think the metaphoric thinking is very powerful. That's why I asked that question earlier on the phantom stuff, because that gets into a very wide range of metaphors as well. But the easy in, hard out is a very nice way of thinking about how you can go between 10, 20 different domains. Yes. So. Um, so do you think, Garrett, that his uh, latest paper, um, you know, electric field and voltage fluctuations and the Casimir effect, uh, do you think that helps to explain your results? It, it... Uh, well, as, as Larry has said, and uh, I, I will also be saying on Saturday, um, he doesn't have an asymmetry there. And, mm -hmm. and in fact, specifically says there's no asymmetry. So in other words, the fluctuations cause currents in both directions. There is no net power. And uh, so it, it, we, we, act, we have two results. There were actually two papers. The one is the uh, FizRev review paper, research paper, which talks about a change in conductivity. And I think his theory nicely uh, models that. Uh, but for the one where we actually get power, as he himself said, no, he does not model that because there we're getting current asymmetrically. We're getting it in one direction. Right, right. I see. Hey, Charles, this is Sonny. Could I weigh in on this? Oh, sure. <clears throat> I wrote down a couple of notes. I did like a couple of his uh, uh, phrases that he used, the metaphors or analogies. Um, <clears throat> you know, simple QFT is a relentless banker, he said, uh, that requires all bills be paid just like uh, Garrett highlighted, uh, when kind of pressed about the ability to uh, deflate the cosmic balloon, if you will, uh, he's, you know, he articulated that based on you know, the current understanding of QFT, there was not an obvious mechanism. 
Uh, but he did highlight an issue, right? To curve space time changes the game. Right. If you, you know, you've heard me talk about uh, if you if you envision physics as a Venn diagram today, you have two circles and they only touch at a, at a single tangent point. Uh, you know, you have general relativity and, and is the word in one circle and quantum mechanics is the word in the other. Uh, so we know that, you know, this, there's still this disconnect between the, the two points of view. And, and uh, so it's almost like quantum field theory is an amazing uh, model and modeling system. But it's it's akin to special relativity. There's a more generalized understanding that we have yet to develop. Uh, and in the process of doing that, does that help us understand uh, new ways to view things? That when we view it in this framework, you can only do this with it. When you view it in this framework, then you can maybe there's a way to establish some kind of an asymmetry that allows you to uh, deflate the cosmic balloon, if you will. Again, that's just an, a crude analogy, but it's it's a way to say somebody's paying the bill. The spring was was already cocked at the beginning of the universe, if you will. Right. Uh, so, as you know from the work that I'm interested in, and the work that uh, John Bush is interested in, and I think you heard a little bit. I, I didn't catch all of Duval's talk today. I had a, another meeting, but um, uh, uh, studying a, a deeper understanding of, of the vacuum itself, and you know, understanding the quantum vacuum is incomplete, and maybe there's more to it than when we typically think about it and model it in quantum field theory. Anyway, I'll shut up now. Yeah, and you know, Sean Wei also he mentioned and recognizes that in curved space time, the vacuum is not symmetric. And that if it's not something that's not symmetric, that allows you, uh, according to the rules, to generate a force um, from that. And so the, but you know, the the effect is very small of the curvature on the vacuum. Um, so, you know, it also reminds me of Jack Wisdom's swimming in space-time work, right? Where you can um, change something inside a body, not the outside. And because of the fact that it's in curved space-time, you can get motion out of that. Now it's really super small, too small to even measure. But, uh, you know, that was a paper he published in Science a number of years ago um, and showing that, yeah, hey, you can do something with curved space time and kind of get something for free. So uh, so I joined a little late, so uh, excuse me if this has already been answered, but as you say that uh, uh, vacuum fluctuations where you've got a current going back and forth, uh, it can't generate a direct current, but uh, why couldn't this uh, be used for AC power generation? Is that a question for Garrett or Charles? Uh, Garrett, a bit. It's an interesting question. Uh, I, I'm sort of scratching my head here. Now, I think Larry Ford would say, the issue isn't so much whether it's AC or DC, but whether you're actually harvesting power, because his, his whole point is you can't get the power from the vacuum. Uh, but yet, that, that does bring in a, a bit of a paradox, and I've got to mull over that one. Okay, cool. Talk about that uh, more, I guess. I don't know. Might be worth trying, who knows. Hey, Charles, I think I've seen Jacek raise his hand a couple of times. Oh yeah, Jacek, do you have a comment? Yes, I'm, 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 I'm hearing all this. Can it be estimated how much power do we have in one cubic meter of this pace? Yeah, it's like a terawatt per um, cubic centimeter or something ridiculous like that. I've seen those estimates. Do you know off the top of your head, Garrett? It's, it's just huge. Uh, because I heard, uh, yeah, I had a statement from the physicist, the um, uh, physics professor in Germany, who stated that the one cubic uh, meter of uh, vacuum exists so much ener energy that humanity in its uh, whole history didn't use from fossil fossil um, sources. Is it realistic? So as, as, as 
uh, we all know the issue there is what the cutoff frequency is. And so if you're using Planck scales for, for cutoffs, then you get these embarrassingly large energy densities. I don't think it's really meaningful because uh, we're not interacting with those Planck, uh, with those ultra high frequencies. It's really the frequencies that we're interacting with that give us the relevant amount of energy. And I don't think it's specifically the energy density that's the most relevant parameter. I think it's the power. And uh, so I've done a back of the envelope calculation on, for example, how much power you get in roughly the visible uh, wavelength range from uh, vacuum energy. And it turns out to be about one gigawatt per square meter. And so that, I think that's more of the, the relevant type of numbers that. Mm -hmm. And yet, like Mike Fitty brings up, well, you know, that our, uh, how it, it doesn't affect our eyes, right? Uh, you would think that amount of energy would just in the past since my days at, at Lockheed and uh, currently on the- I don't know what someone is playing the video. And so th thank you for- uh, I was like, hey, Robert, Solomon, so you're, say, we're getting you know, Charles Chase's voice back to your feed. Thank you. Hey, Charles, you got muted. Uh, thank you. I, I, I muted Robert, so we don't have to hear me twice. <laughs> Could I weigh in on that vacuum energy question? Sure. <clears throat> you know, the, the vacuum catastrophe, I, I thought I heard in an earlier talk as well, somebody highlighted that. It might have been, been in Mike Fitty's talk where he talked about the vacuum catastrophe and you know, 10 to the minus 27 kilograms per cubic meter versus 10 to the 96 kilograms per cubic meter. Um, you know, these huge order of differences. Uh, there's a paper, uh, I'm, and I'm not offering this up as a solution. I'm just offering this as, this up as a, a paper, maybe interesting of uh, 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 interesting for further consideration on this topic. Uh, there's a paper by Marcel Urban in uh, EPJD called "The Quantum Vacuum as the Origin." of the speed of light, where uh, in the paper, they derived the speed of light as a result of vacuum fluctuations impeding photon flow through a series of capture and emissions. Uh, there's an equation in that paper you can pick out and then kind of go through an exercise and figure out what does, what does epsilon naught and mu naught suggest the density of the vacuum would need to be. And you get a, you get a number that's about 20 orders of magnitude, no, uh, maybe 30 orders of magnitude bigger uh, than what the cosmological dark energy value would be uh, from general relativity. I think it's 10 to the minus. It's been a while since I did that calculation. I was thinking it was like 10 to the ninth kilograms per uh, cubic meter. But um, uh, anyway, just something to think about. That's another uh, interesting perspective of some numbers that we know experimentally very, very well. Some kind of a thought press process also yields yet another number for what that might be. And that speaks to what Garrett uh, Modell says, where's that cutoff? And, does that paper maybe help us better understand where a cutoff might be and why it might be the value that it is? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, Gene Kidman had an interesting comment in the chat. Uh, is entropy asymmetric over space? Could that field be used to recover energy? So yeah, is the disorder the same in every direction or is there some asymmetry to the disorder? Um, interesting question. Any, you want to comment further on that, Gene, or? Um, when we talk a bit about how there could be asymmetry on a very large scale in the vacuum energy if space-time is curved. So that's definitely, the, that, well, not definitely, but that could be the case. I don't know if it, I don't know if it's that local. Mm -hmm. There is the possibility that comes from the Gibbs equ equation, which is kind of funny. Uh, what we're talking about is the energy that would happen from a quantum change uh, winds up being uh, the heat that's put off of it, and then the uh, 
multiplication product of the temperature times the entropy being produced. And, and that generates the interesting question. And we've always assumed that, that entropy is something to do with order, right? But what, uh, but from a unit point analysis, entropy should be some kind of energy. Well, that means that it should, it could potentially be some kind of mass, uh, which interestingly enough is, uh, I think we talked about the, the Russian the other day, um, Kozakov, Korsakov, I think his name was, uh, in his analysis, he comes out and show, and in a way shows uh, the possibility that entropy is some kind of small mass. And he has some detectors that he sets up where, where he detects this uh, flow of entropy as if it were particulate coming from um, a source of entropy. So it's just, a, it's just one of those crazy possibilities that maybe we don't understand the physicality of entropy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Interesting comment. So um, yeah, thanks for the discussion.